The last 200 years of Western civilization has brought us an unprecedented amount of wealth, longevity, and comfort. And especially in the modern day, we forget how, how difficult it has been for most, of, most people that have lived. Starvation, disease, and a multitude of other threats to each person's life whittled the current human beings into who we are today. And we can see this most clearly with the distribution of traits that human beings have evolved to have. Every individual has, has traits that aren't there just arbitrarily. You know, you're not as tall as you are because, because someone just arbitrarily randomly decided that. That's a trait that has been evolved into you, that has taken thousands and thousands or millions of years to turn you into who you are today. And there's probably an infinite number, no, infinite number of these traits that exist within human beings. And one of the most elusive and interesting one of these traits is personality. This abstract, ethereal way that we can understand the processes behind our, our minds. The best and most scientifically objective way of understanding personality that we have today is the five-factor personality model, model, or the big five model of personality. And in this video, I'm going to show what are the causes of the emergence of these different forms within the human mind. And what are the trade-offs that each kind of mental niche that we've found ourselves in, what are the trade-offs that each offers? At the end of the day, there are many different types of people, there are many different types of animals, there are many different forms that inhabit reality because there are different strategies that work. If there weren't, if there was only one solution, if there was one perfect organism or one perfect human being, then all people would probably be the same, but they're not. And that's because that there are different ways to win in the game of life. And, well, I would say that there is, there's two basically meta strategies that exist. You can have a medium to low risk build, or you can have an extremely high risk build. And the high risk, you know, types of people, you know, they're much more likely to die. They're much more likely to not pass along their genes. But if they win, if they hit it big, then they succeed in a huge manner. And that's, that's probably one of the reasons why we don't see an extreme expression of traits or an extreme expression of certain types of traits because they are inherently risky. They are inherently dangerous and they make it so that the likelihood that you die if you have these traits is a lot higher. So let's get into the five-factor model of personality. So as the name suggests, the, or this model is essentially segmented into five different binary categories. Uh, the first one is the introvert versus extrovert dimension. 
the agreeable to disagreeable dimension, the conscientiousness dimension, the openness dimension, and the neuroticism dimension. So introversion versus extroversion essentially means that uh, extroverts get quote-unquote energy from being around people, whereas introverts uh, lose energy by being around unfamiliar people. Disagreeability versus agreeability means essentially that agreeable people want to do the best they possibly can to be in everyone's good graces. They don't want to offend, they don't want to, you know, seem pushy, and they, you know, they more or less given to the demands of others instead of conflict, conflicting with them. And disagreeable, disagreeable people don't care at all. They essentially, they, they thrive on conflict. They enjoy, you know, disagreeing with people and battling with people and, and, and such. Uh, conscientiousness is, is a dimension under which you know, high conscientious people are workaholics. They work extremely hard and, you know, they're willing to put in an incredible amount of energy on their work. They, this type also uh, is actually high in guilt. So, well, or, or they're more sensitive to guilt. And, and oftentimes this comes about in feeling guilty that they didn't work enough or they didn't do enough and that kind of motivates them to do as much as they humanly can. And low conscientiousness people, you know, they're lazy and they try and expend as little energy as they possibly can. Uh, the openness dimension essentially means how open you are to new ideas, new ways of thinking, uh, different modes of being, counter to, you know, what you already believe or what already exists out there or what society tells you. Um, openness essentially means that you're willing to drive or blaze your own path. You know, you don't need to walk on the same path that others have before you in any dimension, right? Uh, in terms of philosophy, in terms of art, etc. And low openness people essentially are, you know, they want to do things exactly by the book. They want to make sure that you know, they don't deviate at all from what has existed before. Uh, they're, you know, staunchly stick in the mud. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to change. I'm not going to change my ideas. I'm going to stick to what I, you know, what already exists. And then neuroticism is essentially how sensitive you are to negative emotion. People who are high in neuroticism, you know, are extremely, how would you say it, um, well, if the smallest thing, you know, if there's the smallest risk or the smallest potential of harm or, you know, things are slightly wrong, right, they're, they're going to be extremely sensitive to that. Um, and, and this type is also like very kind of, let's say, unstable or, you know, they, they kind of, uh, how would you say it? They, well... I'd say hyper, I'd, I, would, I would argue that they're pretty hyper reactive. They aren't really comfortable in any one position because, well, you know, they're, they're, they're sensitive to any negative elements of that, you know, place that they're in. And then low neuroticism people are pretty, you know, I would say cool under pressure and don't really get influenced that much by, you know, anxiety and and negative emotions and well imagine someone on ayahuasca or ayahuasca or ashwagandha not ayahuasca ashwagandha root um, you know pretty blunted emotions in terms of the negative side so so these are five different dimensions that we can analyze human beings on this is a model um, and science works in models Models are not reality, and and if you're if you if you're if you're gonna you know wag your finger at, at this model and say hey no this isn't real it's da, da, then then you're essentially wagging your fin finger at 
the idea of models in science. This isn't meant to explain everything. It's meant to explain one particular way of looking at human beings. And, and the five-factor model of personality is the best model of personality we currently have. It's better than the Myers-Briggs test. It's better than, than the Strength Finder test. It's better than pretty much everything. And, and if, you're, if we're going to objectively look at personality, then this is probably the best model to use. So, well, also <laughs> aiming for perfection in hypothesis and model building is, uh, that's, I think it's a misguided look. You want to, as an academic, as a scholar, your aim should be to try and figure out what are the potential realities, and then you scientifically verify it with data. Um, but what we're doing here is we're trying to develop a hypothesis. We're trying to understand the human condition better. And, and that's, that's essentially what we're going to be doing in this talk. So getting right into it, you know what the five-factor model of personality is and what our general kind of approach is. So here's, here's the theory. Each of these dimensions, with the, with the exception of introversion versus extroversion, has a risky option and has a non-risky option. Introversion versus extroversion, I would say that there is a slightly higher risk in the extroverted factor. And Actually, before we continue more on this, what I mean by risk is if you spec into one side compared to another more, right, if, if you're more, let's say, extroverted compared to introverted, I'm going to be arguing that that's risky to you as an individual. And that means that you're just more likely to die with this. There's a higher probability that you're going to put yourself into a position where you get killed because of it. And, and this, I would say, explains why there is a variance in, in human beings. Because, well, certain things are more risky than others. There's a probability, a higher probability in certain traits that you're going to die if you have them. And, well, that's... That's what I mean by risk, so let's get into it. The introvert versus extrovert dimension, I think you can, you can argue that either one is riskier. Uh, extroverted, I could say, might be considered more, uh, slightly more risky because you're interacting with more people. And you know, if you interact with 100 people, what's the likelihood that you're going to meet one psychopath or sociopath or narcissist, right? It's going to be like 1% to 10%. And, and, you know, what happens if you meet the wrong person that, like, ends up getting you killed somehow? Um, that's where I say the risk would be in the extroverted dimension. But I would say that the introverted dimension is also risky. Because if you're alone, right, you don't have a big, uh, let's say, a, a big tribe of people to rely upon. And you're more isolated. And being more isolated, not having a huge number of people that you're, you know, relying upon because you're, you don't want to spend the energy to do so, means that, well, you know, you don't have the strength in numbers. So, so I'd say there's, there's a probably an equal risk in extroversion and introversion. Um, and, and we kind of, we more or less see that there is a even distribution between extroverts and introverts. Some people say that there's less introverts, but more or less, you know, there's a round and equal, you know, spread. The next function we have is disagreeability versus agreeability. And I'd say that there's a, there's a slight risk in the extremes of both, but agreeableness is a safer option than disagreeability. Disagreeability, I think there's a, 
the, the risk in that is pretty self-explanatory, but I'm going to explain it anyway. You know, if you, I mean, disagreeable people are more likely to get into conflict. They're more likely to voice an opinion that's going to piss someone off. And if I'm disagreeable, then what happens, you know, there's just a higher probability that I'm going to get into a, you know, a, an altercation that gets me killed. But, you know, there's a, there's a huge benefit of disagreeability. It means that you're, you're willing to put your will out there. You're willing to, you know, say your mind. And, and the, the, the reward of that is, you know, you win battles. If you're agreeable, if you're super agreeable and you're not willing to fight any battles, then you're missing, well, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. And agreeable people, hyper agreeable people, are way less likely to make any shots in terms of conflict. So, disagreeability is high risk and high reward. And agreeability, hyper agreeability, is really safe, I would say. The only, the only lack of safety that exists in agreeability is if you follow the wrong person or you follow the wrong society, right? The next factor is conscientiousness. And you could say, conscientiousness, right? People who are really hardworking, how is this a risky trait? But I'm going to say that it definitely is a risky trait. Conscientiousness is essentially, you know, you're willing to spend a huge amount of energy every single day non-stop. Oh, I'm willing to put in a 16-hour day every day, weekends included. That's a conscientious person. And you could say, well, how, how is that risky? Well, it's risky because what would someone in Neolithic times with this mindset do? What would happen if you are a caveman and you go out there and you put 100% of your energy out there and then you don't get any food. And then what happens if the next day you put 100% of your energy out there and you don't get any food? And the next day, well, in a couple of days, you know, you're probably going to starve faster than the lazy person because you're, you're, you're putting way more energy out there for no reward. And, and you know, maybe there's a, a higher likelihood that you get a... A, you know a, a big catch because you put more energy into it but you know that's not a guarantee so you know I'd say that human beings are are more likely to be less conscientious due to the simple fact that you know burning your energy is costly and w we don't really see this nowadays because you know there's there's in Western societies there's you know our tables are overflowing with food. We don't have a starvation problem. We have an obesity problem. And, and food is something we don't really think about much. You know, may, maybe you think about it a little bit with your budget, but you're not starving. So conscientiousness, historically, is a, is a risk. But in the modern day, it's, a, it's not a risk. It's actually a huge benefit. Because it means that, you know, because we have a guarantee today that if you work more, you're probably going to get paid more. Which is, you know, which it seems like it's a little bit of a fluke compared to our previous history. But regardless, there aren't, I mean, this is why we don't see everyone being a highly conscientious person. Most people are kind of mid-conscientiousness. The next factor is openness. And being high in openness means that you are willing to completely change your belief system, potentially at the drop of a hat. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to claim that this is a huge risk. People people's minds end up crystallizing. Their intelligence crystallizes from like 25 onwards, meaning that they no longer change their worldview to a huge amount. They kind of get set in their ways and set in their, 
their, how would you say it, their patterns and the way that they live. And, and I think that this makes a lot of sense because the fact that you survived to be 25 and 30 years old means that you survived. And it means that everything that got you there probably works good enough. And one of the things that gets you to where you are is or are your beliefs. How you view the world, how you interpret reality guides your decisions and guides how you, you know, get to where you are. So if the beliefs that you had in your youth, you know, got you to be 25 to 30 years old, then, you know, evolution is going to say, well, hey, that's good enough. You know, you don't need to change your viewpoint because, you know, this is good. This works. And for most of human history, society didn't really change much. You know, this, there were the same technologies and the same systems of governance and, and, and things didn't change much. So, so, you know, this makes sense. But what happens in the age of extreme technological change and extreme change in philosophy and our understanding of the world and science? Uh, openness suddenly makes a lot more sense. But the problem is that, well, you have an individual risk mitigation, you know, combating something else. And, and at the end of the day, right, the risk is that, you know, let's say you're 30 years old and you completely drop all of your beliefs and assumptions about reality and, and, and pick up the exact opposite belief system, right? What's the likelihood that the new belief system that you adopt actually aligns to reality? and actually will help you predict reality better. Is it high or is it low? You know, you don't know. You don't know what the likelihood is. You know, if you, if you completely revolutionize your thought, maybe you revolutionize it in the wrong direction and now you believe something stupid that doesn't make any sense. And then you get, you die because of it. You know, that, that could definitely happen, right? Which is why I think our intelligence crystallizes and why I would say that highly open people, people with high openness, people with high creativity are actually pretty rare. Um, and low openness makes a lot of sense, right? Because another factor we have to look at is how does society perceive you, right? If you are highly open and you say, you know what, let me question the orthodoxy. Let me question everything my society believes. Wait a minute, what, what, uh, what society believes might be wrong. You go out in a intolerant society saying things like that. You know, historically you get killed. Historically, you don't survive. The emperor says, Oh, this person is questioning my rule, my mandate of heaven? Yeah, kill this man. So openness is a risky, risky choice for multiple reasons. Because you could be open to, the, to something that isn't aligned to reality. And you could be open to ideas that are contrary to power interests that get you killed. Uh, for, for starters. So high openness is risk risky. And finally, we have neuroticism. If you're too, too neurotic, I would say that, you know, you're probably going to be jumping around and making erratic decisions and, you know, oh, shoot, <laughs> you, you hear something, you know, you hear a bump downstairs and then you're not going to be able to sleep all night and you're going to, yeah, you're going to be scared and, uh, you know, neuro high, highly neurotic people, you know, there's just the, the, the chaos of, of how they live probably means that, you know, it's, it's just not a, it doesn't make much sense. But, to be fair, 
people who are highly neurotic are probably less likely to get killed by something that, you know, is, is, is subtly there, right? Like, let's say there's a tiger stalking you in the distance, right? If you're incredibly neurotic, then the tiniest observations you make would scare the hell out of you, right? And you'd probably be way more on edge. And, and that probably makes it so that you're more likely to survive, potentially. On the opposite hand, low neuroticism, right? If you're, if you're just not really, you know, sensitive to negative emotion, you know, maybe you don't take huge threats as seriously. And, you know, you're cool under pressure, but, but your emotions are there, not as something that you just battle. They're there because they're trying to tell you something. And if you have low neuroticism, then you're probably less likely to listen to these emotions, which means that there's probably a higher likelihood you put yourself into a place where you end up getting killed. Potentially. So, at the end of the day, people adhere to a normal distribution. You don't have everyone in one niche and everyone in another niche. There's a probability that you are anywhere on this spectrum. And this also goes for IQ, right? There are a cut there, are, you know, there's a small number of very smart people and a small number of very stupid people. And most people are midwits who are around IQ 100. And you could say, well, why is that? Well, because I think, I think it goes into the same reasons for openness, right? People who are probably very smart might come to conclusions that are against the orthodoxy. And, you know, that could probably get them killed. And maybe there's also ways that, you know, the brains of highly intelligent people work that, you know, maybe make other things less efficient, potentially. I don't know. You know, maybe, maybe you, let's say, let's say you're talking to a girl, right? and you're super high IQ, you know, maybe you don't really, you don't really care about, you know, being a good conversationalist and you just care about like, you know, high, high level ideas. And maybe that ends up hurting you. I don't know. So, so there's a reason, you know, and this, these are just two spitball ideas, but there are reasons likely why people with high IQs are not, you know, commonplace. So, anyway, there are different, there's a distribution of human traits. And I think that the extremes of human traits are selected against because they are risky, as I've demonstrated. And fundamentally, I would also say that the risk in these traits comes from the fact in almost every single one of these traits, that you have more conscious control if you have an extreme trait. Like people who are highly disagreeable, they're more willing to say what they think. And, and what they think stems from their mind, from their soul, from their consciousness. And it's, you know, you're willing to give your soul, you know, a talking stage even if you're standing in the face of someone who, you know, is going to conflict with you. If you're high conscientiousness, right, the drive to save energy isn't going to prevent you from putting your will to work. If you're highly conscientious, you're willing to move mountains because your will tells you to, right, because your consciousness wants it. There's, there's less of a, there's no mental barrier there. With openness, you know, your consciousness is free to select any idea that's out there, right? With low neuroticism, which is the riskier trait, you know, you're not going to be, you know, your brain isn't going to, you know, fill in the details of what you should be afraid of. It, it kind of puts your conscious mind into a state of, you know, you need to be aware of everything in a non-emotional manner. And you need to react to risks in a non-emotional manner. Because if you don't, you're gonna die. So it, it, extreme traits, I would argue, 
make it so that people are more consciously in control of everything in their body, everything that they do. And if you are, if you have different traits like high agreeability, potentially, um, low conscientiousness, high agreeability means that you are defaulting to an evolutionary program of, you know, people please everyone and make sure that no one gets offended by you. And, and you know, this isn't something that you want to do, right? It's, you would ideally want to do what you want to do, right? But people with high agreeability want to do what everyone else wants to do because I don't think it's what their soul wants, it's what their body wants. It's what keeps them safe. Low conscientiousness people, you know, maybe they want a million dollars, right? But they don't want to, they're, 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 they have a mental safeguard to prevent them from using as much energy, which, which keeps them, you know, lazy and maybe at a low job, but it keeps them safe, right? People who are low openness, you know, they only can see a small, you know, they're only willing to accept a small little segment of what but the potential reality of the world is. And maybe they, they choose the wrong, the wrong, uh, the wrong answer too. Um, so, so it, it prevents their soul from seeing people who are, you know, maybe mid-level neuroticism or even high-level neuroticism, you know, they rely on the brain's ability to recognize small little patterns or, or, you know, you know, pick up on unconscious phenomena, which, which shows up in, in these non-conscious non-rational emotions and 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 ultimately like this I think this reveals an element of human beings which is you know people can either you know give in to having a high degree of will a high degree of conscious control or they can default to how would you say it automated evolutionary strategies which is which which I think is is crazy but, but we but we see this we literally see this in well historically it's, historically we see this and this is a trend that we we notice i think like here's here's an example in in the american revolution which is one of the most unprecedented and and well, unprecedented, one of the most unprecedented historical phenomena that we've ever seen in humanity. 45% of people, around 45% of people were neutral in that conflict. They didn't want to join the patriots and they didn't want to join the loyalists. So they were kind of stuck in the middle. 20% of people were supporting the British Empire 20 percent a huge it's a huge amount and then you know 35 percent of people were supporting the Patriots more or less and and then an even smaller amount of those people actually fought um, some some people say that you know three to five percent of people were like really the true believers. Now, 10 to 15% of people in the, in the Americas fought in the American Revolution, approximately, you know, over the entire course, here and there. Um, and I'd say around, what I, a figure I've seen is around 40,000 people at any one time were fighting for the Americans. But, well, the number of pension files and bounty land warrant applications that we have number in around 8,000, 80,000, which is around 3% of the population. So the people who kind of, you know, went through the official channels to join the revolution, and I would argue who were true believers, who really, really believed in the revolution and weren't just, you know, conscripted, were were pre was pretty small, was in, you know, the 3 to 5% range of the population. A, a huge number of people in the American Revolution were forced to fight. They weren't people who wanted to. They were, hey, you, you, you're, you're now fighting for us. You know, you're now protecting this, this town. Um, and, and people didn't really have a choice. It was, it was a brutal war. 
And, and, and the point here, the point here is, right, a small number of people decided to go against what has been a, a, like a common, or let's say, to, to go against the tide of history. The tide of history has been, you know, you have these giant lumbering empires that, you know, like, like Rome, like the Spanish, that just, you know, trudge along and they, you know, steamroll people in their path and they create a giant system. Um, and, and the American society is something that hasn't really existed before in human history, which is why we see, you know, the, well, the industrial revolutions and the scientific revolutions really emerge or really explode in the Americas. But, but here's the fundamental point. This revolution was a result of counterintuitive beliefs and a fundamental will on the part of the founders. You know, this wasn't something that just happened. It was something that a small number of people, a small number of, of extraordinary people, right, forced into being. And and the, the point here is that the real movers in history, the real people who have, who, whose ideas about reality, whose wants and desires for reality are actually actualized. The people who have the ability to actualize the, the longings of the soul are very low. The people who, who have the facilities of the personality, who have the intelligence, I think, I think are by definition are very low, right? The American Revolution, you know, three to five percent of them, of, of the American population, had that ability, had that will, right? And, and maybe at max, 35 percent, you know, thir the 35 percent of the patriots were willing to, you know, believe in something and, and, and you know, support something that was counter to the current prevailing society. And, and, and they won, right? They moved history. So, and they moved history in a way that, it, that wasn't deterministic. This wasn't something that was, you know, I would say it was historically unprecedented. So, So fundamentally, the point here is that, that, well, ultimately, it's hard for people to, I'd say, biologically, in terms of personality, give their souls the spotlight, give their souls the reins. Most of it, just to make us safe, most of our, our, our you know, personality and most of our, you know, intelligence is, is non-conscious. And you know, and we, we know this, right? Most of, most of what we are is deterministic. But some people are less deterministic than others. And, and, and the people who are less deterministic are the movers of history, I would say. Because they're the ones taking the risks. And the only way that history changes is through risk. History stays the same with no risk. History changes with risk. And there are evolutionary forces that combat risk. 
So, well, a takeaway from that is, you know, to make sure that we continue evolving as a species, that we continue moving forward, we need to make it so that risk isn't something that is, is, is penalized by us, by our societies. And if we look at the, the unprecedented economic explosion of the industrial revolutions, one of the reasons why we had that explosion was due to the fact that if you made a risk, if you took a risk, if you made an invention, if you spent years of your life creating something that hadn't existed before, you wouldn't starve. You wouldn't die. You wouldn't be killed for something new. On the contrary, the people who risked the most tended to actually succeed the most. And this trend has has continued to today, right? The people who are highly conscientious today are the ones who are winning. The people who are, you know, sometimes highly disagreeable are the ones who win. Like, for example, like Elon Musk, one of the smartest people, well, maybe not one of the smartest, one of the richest people, I mean, today, is, it's well known that he's a highly disagreeable person, right? He, he fires lots of people, he, you know, he doesn't, He's stubborn. He says, no, we're doing it this way. And if, and if you disagree, then you're fired. Right? Extremely disagreeable person. But you could argue that the only way he got to where he is is because he was willing to be highly disagreeable. And, yeah. Openness, right? You know, people today, I mean, there's an entire, there's an entire kind of niche little, how would you say it? Like, uh, not social group, but well, there's a niche, a cultural niche today of the um, of the open-minded activist, the open-minded, you know, picketer who has a, you know, the, the the hippie, you know, the person who says, oh, "I'm gonna fight the tyrannical oppression and the the orthodoxies of the past," right? The revolutionary is a, is a trendy niche today, right? People in droves, in droves are turning up to be a revolutionary, to be the person with the picket fence or the picket, um, a picket sign, you know, and protest, right? Historically, this is something that would not be tolerated, but people like this, who you could argue have high openness, right? It's now something that is like a, a status thing. Oh, I went to a protest, right? I am an activist. I went out there, you know. I'm people are flaunting, and I would say oftentimes, you know, pretending to be in high openness by doing these performative acts, which means that openness is no longer something that evolutionarily, you know, gets you killed at least over the last 40 years it hasn't been the case or last you know 60 years the openness is no longer a highly risky thing it's actually the opposite it's a status thing it's something that you know steve jobs was high in openness right and he he created one of the biggest and most influential companies to ever exist you know low neuroticism you know people who are willing to Stay, keep steady at the wheel, right? Someone who might see a bunch of indicators on, let's say, social media, for example, right? Oh, I'm not getting enough likes. Oh, I'm not, my business isn't gaining money, right? Someone with high neuroticism wouldn't be willing to, to put themselves through the emotional strain of seeing a negative number, you know, oh, low likes, low likes, low likes, or low, uh, low profit, you know, every single day, you know, they'd, pro they'd probably go crazy if they were highly neurotic, um, you know. But people who are, you know, low neuroticism are probably willing to face tough decisions or, or you know, bad indicators for a long period of time, which ends up paying off in the end. So, and, and this is 
only the case, I'm arguing that this is only the case because we live in a society that allows us to make these risks, to take these risks, to live in these extremes and not get punished for it. And we live in a, a society that has the resources, the abundance of resources to make failure something that isn't fatal. And this is a, a blip on the historical record. This is something that is unprecedented. And, well, is that, is that something that is a blip or is that something that can be here to stay? I think that's ultimately our decision. And I want to get into one other thing here, and it's the tragedy of the commons. The tragedy of the commons is an idea where one person or one individual is incentivized to act against the interest of all individuals in a society, in a group, because what, they, what, they, what is good for them is not good for the group. And the evolutionary niches of personality and human variation fall into a very similar area. Each of the factors that I mentioned that, are, that give you high personal risk, I'd say actually decrease the risk for society. People who take a lot of personal risk move society in a better direction, more or less. You know, that's a trend. So, a society that makes it so that people can take more risk ends up having, you know, making their own system work better. A system where low personal risk is incentivized by society increases the risk to society by a huge margin. And, and here's an example. Imagine you're like the lowest risk human build that you can have is probably someone who's maybe highly agreeable and not super conscientious and not super open and maybe mid-level of neuroticism. And this person's probably very attractive and uh, maybe has pretty loose morals. And a, a person like this, you know, maybe they, you know, they're they're willing to, or th maybe this person would be able to, you know, have tons of partners, right? This person beds lots of women, like a Don Juan, and then leaves, and, you know, leaves a trail of, you know, bastard children in his wake. You know, this person would, would most certainly leave behind a lot of his genes. But what would be the result of that? You know, it's good for him, but what's en what ends up happening is that the entire society is probably is way worse off for it, right? Uh, a woman, you know, now has to, is a single mother, now has to care for a child, and, you know, m more or less effectively takes her off of the dating market for high-value men. Uh, you know, you have one guy who leaves lots of these types of women in his wake, you know, it decreases the, you know, the pool of eligible bachelorettes for men, which makes society more violent because men don't really have as many, you know, options to choose from as we see in, you know, Africa today or um, polygamous societies. You know, the, it, it leads to, you know, the, the, you know, genetic builds that make it, that are really good for an individual, I would say, have the risk of hurting everyone in society to, by a huge, huge amount, a huge amount. And, and this is why we need, you know, social systems to fight against this natural inclination. That means we have morality. 
that means that we don't allow individual actors to hurt people like this, you know, and, and, and I think, you know, historically this has been, this has surfaced through religion or, you know, laws against, let's say, adultery or, or fornication or, you know, there, there's a lot of different ways that humanity has kind of, you know, approached this problem. And, and I would say that, that the current trend of saying that we don't need any morality and we don't need any rules and it's all relative is, 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 is so pat patently wrong, so blatantly wrong on so many levels that, that it's, uh, I, mean, I mean, it's astounding. And, well, I think I've given you several reasons as to why I think that, uh, that that's true, but, yeah. In conclusion, personality evolved to mitigate the risk of being, of living in the world we are in. And those who have extreme, or ex who exist at the extremes of personality and who have more of an ability to exert their will on society, not only have a high risk human status build, they also have a high level of responsibility because there's an incredible power to being able to consciously control yourself to that level. If you're an extremely intelligent person who's very disagreeable and highly conscientious and highly open and low in neuroticism, who is willing or who has the ability to, you know, do something in the world, if you end up believing the wrong thing or, or doing something that is not aligned to reality. I think people like this have the ability to, to make the world a much better place or destroy the world. So, well. Don't, ultimately, human beings optimize for themselves or their own, you know, making sure that their own genes survive as individuals. And the issue is that something, like a strategy that works very good, very well for an individual probably, or I would say definitely has a risk for society at large. Probably one of the safest human builds that we could make is, you know, someone who, let's say, you know, has a ton of partners and has like, you know, has a hundred kids and then is, doesn't father any of them. And then, you know, maybe conforms exactly to what the average is. So, you know, their head doesn't get cut off or being too tall or, you know, they're not the tallest blade of grass. You know, you can have some, you know, a mediocre person that, you know, makes a hundred percent sure that their genes get you know, spread all across and, you know, they definitely propagate, right? That works very well for an individual, but what happens to an entire society when, when, you know, people are like that? The society probably collapses and the society doesn't survive. And so I think that's the real reason why high risk and kind of counter, counterintuitive strategies or strategies that don't really help the individual themselves propagate because societies want to make sure that they survive. These abstract systems, you know, these social connections, they wouldn't survive if you didn't have people who are willing to spend a lot more energy, who are willing to make risks that benefit society at large, but probabilistically hurt them. And I think there's, there's, it seems like there's a, there's, there's a clash within 
within our evolution. Human beings, it could be argued, want what's best for themselves. And what's, what, what is best for themselves, in many cases, hurts everyone around them. But everyone around them want, wants, ideally, everyone around you wants what's best for themselves and hopefully everyone else. So you have two forces that, you know, maybe puts, you know, incredibly selfish patterns in place while encouraging the other ones. And I think that a risk, here's a, a big risk that could, could come about here. If you have the balance of society versus individual, skew more towards the individual, especially powerful individuals, right? If there's, there's genetic shortcuts where, let's say someone's extremely attractive, but they're, they're, they have like a midwit IQ and they, you know, you know, they, they, they conform incredibly, meaning that they, you know, they fall into, you know, bad mob mentalities that hurts everyone. And then, you know, let's say they also, you know, have a ton of kids, right? And they don't father anybody. Like, people like that are probably like bombs to society. And if you have a society that, that is set up in such a way that that is encouraged, then it's probably a huge risk towards, the, towards your society and could either lead to your society collapsing or stagnating or becoming something that doesn't improve. So as human beings, we should ensure that our societies, you know, do what's best, not just for us as people, as individuals, but for everyone else. And, and I would say that given all, everything I've talked about, the way we do that is by making it so that high risk evolutionary strategies are, are allowed to flourish. People who are highly conscientious, people who are highly open, people maybe who are disagreeable, people who maybe have low neuroticism, all of these people should not be punished for their extreme personality traits, but they should be rewarded. Because I think what we've seen over the last 200, 300 years is that when you allow people a safe space to innovate, they end up finding things that, are, that we could have never imagined possible. And that pushes humanity forward. And, and that's, that's our goal as human beings. It's not for just the, the, the mindless you know, repetition of our genetics. It's for exploring the boundaries of reality, exploring what there is and then creating. And, and, and in order to prevent that beautiful human story from collapsing into a, uh, an animalistic one where it's all about, you know, individual people and, oh, I want to, I will do what's best for me. I think we need to understand these evolutionary systems and, and understand how to encourage innovation and how not to punish it. Because I think punishing innovation has been a, a constant throughout human history. And, and I think that's, that's fundamentally it.